um, so that when they get back, we can begin. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with St. Hildegard von Bingen, she was a true Renaissance man before those silly masculine Italians got a hold of the word. Um, she was a poet, an herbalist. She wrote one of the first um, pharmaceutical texts in the Western tradition. She wrote plays. Um, she wrote hymns, she wrote music for organ, and as you can see here in this illumination, she also designed, this is a wax tablet and stylus that she's writing with, um, so she also designed um, parts of the abbey that she was in charge of, and um, designed the layout for the manuscripts that she wrote so that the scribes could copy them. Um, and uh, she happened to write this prayer, so if you would join me. Holy Spirit, giving life to all life, moving all creatures, root of all things, washing them clean, wiping out their mistakes, healing their wounds, you are our true life, luminous, wonderful, awakening the heart from its ancient sleep. Amen. Uh, she's also been a victim, and she's a doctor of the church. So, get to know her, she's awesome. Um, so, um, she's a good recipe for cookies. Does she? Is that in the pharmaceutical things? No, she has a <laughs> And if you go to the mound, uh, one of the sisters at the mound makes the cookies. How far? She's my daughter's confirmation site, which explains a lot. <laughs> I was going to ask why there was a Portuguese man war on her face. Oh, so that's the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. that, that's why I put that. Yeah, yeah, that's more successful. <laughs> she's also a mystic. Um, yeah, especially she's a mystic. Yeah. So those are the, the tongues of flame okay. coming down, down out of the heavens. Or Portuguese. Okay. Wait, so, we read her last week in my, one of my classes, and the students thought she was. Thought she was crazy? Yeah. Yeah, well, but it's, it's very good. So I went that way with this too. Yeah, it's good. It's right. It's right. It's right. Yeah, they, they think that about uh, St. Teresa when I read them the text that Bernini based the ecstasy on. Um, so uh, these are our two paintings. Um, and I want to start with an exercise that I use in our appreciation, but in a lot of classes. Um, and you're welcome to copy, borrow, steal, credit, however you want, um, called Think, Pair, Share. Um, and so I want you to think back to the first thing you thought when you looked at each of the paintings and write it down. For real? Go ahead. Did you say both, or did you say one at... For, when, for each of them, what was the first thing you thought when you... Each individually. Correct. If it was not this again, right there? Oh, it's a whole thought. You want a sentence or a sort of Whatever that means to you. something written down. Okay, turn to your table mate and share your thoughts with them. You must be done. So, we've done the think part, we've done the pair part, and now it's the share part. And the share part is you have to volunteer your partner's thoughts to the group. I hope you were paying attention. So, the, and, and, and you know, like, brief meta moment for you as professors, right? This means they don't have to be embarrassed because they're not the ones who thought of it, right? They can, they can share more freely because it wasn't that scary to share with one person. And now you can be the one who throws it out to the room. So, um, Throw your peers under the bus, folks. <laughs> sure. 
the depths of Picasso's work is what stood out to Daffy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the little girls look angelic. Or like dolls. Oh, they look like dolls. Like dolls. They look like dolls. It's a little different than the Oompa Loompa. Okay. So what else? So Oompa Loompas, dolls, Picasso's work has a lot of depth in it. Sarah was interested in the two figures in the back. So the... In the, wind, in the doorways. So, so the friend, this guy and his counterpart were those two people? Uh, in, the in the doorway. In the doorway. Okay. So, and so that was just see see this silhouette here. Yeah. Josh wants to know why this chick on the right... She's little girl. I call her a little girl. girl. <laughs> why she is so pissed off. Okay. She didn't dress up. The, the, this one? Yeah, the one in the window. This yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, her. She's, yeah. she's on the attendance. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, we can talk about all this. Keep going. We're just generating, like, these are first impressions, right? And that's important. The darkness of the one thing, the shadows of it, versus the light of the other. Okay. And that's that's heightened by this particular projection, because I had to turn the brightness up so we can even see it. Um, it looks like it's always a photo negative. But I think it's good. Okay, so that's, so that's an interesting thing when we're thinking about compare and contrast between the two of them, right? The value relationship. And Heidi was really drawn to the to the darkness of the whole upper half mm -hmm. of the older painting. Mm -hmm. That it was just that that was what grabbed her attention. Okay. Uh, what happened to the dog? The dog <laughs> <laughs> apparently changed breeds. <laughs> yes. I would say. Okay. As well as complexion. Mm -hmm. Or maybe species. It's <laughs> 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 <So> a rabbit. <laughs> well, the foot's still on the, the foot's still on the, the dog, though. The dog's still on it. The foot's on it. The foot's on it. Okay, so okay, so these are these are first impressions, right? These are these are the, the thing you see it and the first thing that occurs to you, and you should now share that with your partner and. Now your partner has shared them with us. I also heard a couple of comments um, as you were discussing with each other that I want to bring to the fore. Um, one is, oh, that totally changes my perspective. Okay, um, which is an interesting comment in and of itself, but it's particularly interesting with these two artists because that term perspective actually means something very specific in art history. Um, we just use it for these are perspective. Well, and they, and they both deal with perspectives. It's not just used in them, it's actually one of the subjects of both of these paintings. Okay. Um, and um, the, the other one has to do, and I can't remember exactly how it was phrased, um, but the other one had to do with which one would I rather stand in front of, or which one would I rather have, or own, or claim as my own. Um, and Right, and, and so there were, you know, and there was some conversation around that, and and that is interesting because it gives us a framework through which to evaluate something, right? And and often when we're thrown into a new thing, we don't have a framework through which to judge it, through which to evaluate it, even before we get to judging. Um, and so coming up with a framework. Is, is important. It's, it's, a, it's a way to start a conversation. And so by breaking out of the default framework of I don't know anything about art or I, modern art annoys me or right, any of these sort of in, you know, not even necessarily explicit things that we carry inside of us, let's maybe start with a framework of I can know something about this. Okay, and, and before we make any kinds of evaluations, and so we can we can just observe, right? Which is what the video about formal analysis will introduce you to this concept of I don't have to know anything about context, I don't have to know anything about art history, I can just say this is what I see. Right? So what do you see, anybody, in one of these paintings? And it, and, and be as as bland and mundane as possible to start with. The chaos in the Picasso. Okay. This was called disorder to my colleague. In, the, in contrast with Ogre in the first. Okay. 
Right, so this one you've got your typical converging lines as you go mm -hmm. farther away. Mm -hmm. um, more detail as you're closer versus more right. vague, right. less colored as you go farther. Mm -hmm. But you don't have any of that in the costume. Actually, you do. Oh, yeah, you do. I guess you do have yeah. some. Because okay, you look at that, at that thing on the left uh, that looks like uh, a square with a, a stick coming out of it. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. A square with a stick. I see a square with a stick coming out of it, right? Start there. Okay, I see a square with a stick coming out of it. In this one, I see a lot of shapes. I don't know the names of all those shapes, but they're shapes, right? In this one, I see a lot of shapes, but those shapes appear to describe three-dimensional forms. Okay, so this, this is a way to, to get past even the, um, you know, saying that something is chaotic tends to be painted a certain color, right? Because we have a, we, we dislike chaos or we like chaos, depending on our own personal preferences. Um, yeah. I, well, I, I see relatively the same arrangement of shapes mm -hmm. with one big difference. Okay. That the painter on, on in the Velasquez mm -hmm. is roughly at the same height as the man in the doorway, mm -hmm. and in the other one. <laughs> He goes all the way to the top of the paint. Okay, so we could say that in proportion to the entire field of the painting, right? Picasso's version of Velasquez mm -hmm. is much larger than Velasquez's version of himself. Right? Okay. So does that mean that Picasso is shorter? Could that would be a possible explanation? What else could it be? We also know that I mean. In actual scale, they're probably they're painted about the same size, because this is a painting that's about half the size of that. So if we had the two paintings next to each other, they would actually be about the same size figure. It's just that the rest of the painting has shrunk around the figure of the painter in this one, and that one is, is much larger. It seems to be saying that in 1656, Velasquez was the guy who was painting. In 1957. Velasquez is, you know, on a pedestal. He's a giant. You know, we look at him much bigger now than, we, than you know, he was there. So. Okay, so we've just gone from description to analysis to interpretation, just like that. And it didn't hurt. It actually kind of flowed smoothly. So we described something that we saw in the two paintings. We tried to analyze why that might be so. Um, how is it working within each of the paintings? And that led us to an interpretation, one of which is an interpretation about the two painters' stature, one of which is an interpretation about Picasso's view of his predecessor. Right? And, and both of those right, help us understand this thing, which is perhaps new to us, this painting we haven't seen before. Maybe you've never seen both of them. And so they're both new, and we have to have a way to, to break this down. And this is what we do, whether we know about it or we don't know about it. And how do we even know that these are people? The shadow of somebody in what looks like a different way. So the, the theme that we're discussing this week is using past knowledge to figure out new situations. And I, I played with the wording a little bit to make the bullets um, a little more interesting here, but it's basically the same thing that you have in your document. Um, and so, and, and this is part of the Benedictine value, or we've aligned it partially with the Benedictine value of love of learning. So love of learning inherently requires encountering new information. Right? And that often will mean that we have to go through some sort of process of incorporating that information into our current worldview or adapting our current worldview to accommodate that new information. Or rejecting the new information completely and saying go away. But we're generally saying we want to, you know, learn from these things. So how do we do that? Well, we want this to enrich our understanding, help explain new phenomena, and provide insight into solving new challenges. What we're talking about here is what past experiences do we have that led us to these various activities, intellectual activities of description, 
analysis and interpretation that we just performed. And then we can also talk about how perhaps Picasso was engaging in some of these things when he was looking at Velazquez. But what I want to spend more time on is actually how Velazquez was doing this at his time, too. He was as, just as much of a revolutionary painter as Picasso was in the 20th century. And so we're going to look at, at some things that he was doing and, and talk, about, talk about how that works. So here are the two paintings again. And so, so my question, again, is how do we know that these are representations of people? Yeah, faces. Okay, can we go even further than that? Clothing. No. Like, Most more time. elemental. Think about your perception of, of this, which is there are people shaped. There are people shaped, <laughs> right? And are they? Are they? Well, <laughs> okay, so some of them are, right? And so, so the question is, how do you know, like this, right? Most of you, if you saw that, this figure by itself, you would say, yeah, that's kind of like a person, right? If you saw this by itself, you would say that's kind of a dog. Um, <laughs> I mean, quadruped at least, right? Um, and, you know, maybe this one's a little bit more difficult. But the one person doesn't look like a person. Which person? Yeah. <laughs> Don't call machine for it. Don't call machine for it. That one. The angry girl. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so she's a dwarf in Velasquez's painting. She's a dwarf. She was kept at the royal court because she was non-threatening and she entertained the Infanta. And unlike the dog or the male bodyguard that we can't really see right here, she has a name. We know her name. I don't have it in front of me, but we know all of the figures in this painting except for the name of the dog and the male bodyguard. If you have a printout, it's probably a little bit easier to see than the blown out projection. If you don't have a printout, don't worry about it. So, we're, we're recognizing shapes because we have encountered shapes before, and our brains have learned that generally when I see those shapes in that orientation, that's a face. Right? My daughter, who's one, still kind of figuring this out, but she picked faces up pretty quick. The rest of it, still not so good at. Walking, mm, faces, she could lock onto a face by a week old. So, we encounter perceptions. Our brain figures out how to break them down from every photon entering your eye into this group of photons might mean something, to this group of photons means a face, to a face usually goes on a person. Right? And so that is the process of learning. That is this using past information to help us get richer experience out of a new phenomenon. So in this case, you didn't have trouble finding the faces here or the figures, although some of them are somewhat perhaps shrouded in darkness. But you know, if I ask if, if I gave you a better reproduction of this painting and asked you to, you know, put a number on everybody's head, you would put a number on everybody's head. Here it would take you a little bit longer because what Picasso's doing is he's shifting those outlines, right? He's blurring some of those shapes. And in fact, this kind of, this painting in particular, and, and one of Picasso's um, earlier paintings, Guernica, um, actually use a technique called razzle-dazzle, developed by the US military to hide ships from submarines. It was the first military camouflage. Did Picasso know about Razzle Dazzle? I have no clue. But he knew about a lot of stuff. And Razzle Dazzle was developed by people who had gone to the same art schools that he went to. So what he's doing is using these high contrast, low chroma, right, low color. You would say it's grayscale or it's black and white, right? High contrast, low color, to break space up into something that inherently does not resemble figures that you would recognize. 
which is exactly what we wanted to do to keep German U-boat operators from being able to sight American ships during World War I. Because if those shapes weren't moving in the same direction through the water, they didn't look like a ship, and the guy couldn't tell the torpedo guy where to aim or how far to shoot the torpedo. So he's intentionally doing this to break things up, to make you look harder to find things. And you might say, why the hell would you do that to me, Picasso? <laughs> I just want to look at a painting. So, why would Picasso have a desire in the first place to create his own version of Las Meninas? You've read the quote, right, which he gave about a decade before he went through this project. If someone were to go about recreating Las Meninas, and if that someone were me, eventually I would get to a point where I would start making changes, and it would stop being a copy of Velasquez, it would be mine. Appropriation. So he's appropriating what? His tradition. So it's, it's a tradition. And why is this Picasso's tradition? To be Spanish. Okay, why else? Don't artists often learn by copying great masters? Traditionally, and Picasso was trained in a traditional academy in Barcelona. He was also the son of a famous painting instructor in Spain who worked in the traditional way. So yes, he would have been taught by copying works of masters, and he spent time in Madrid where the Velasquez was on display at the Prado. So he would have seen it as a young man. But this is an old Picasso we're talking about now. It's, it's also the tradition of the relationship between art and the modern. Okay. Relationship between art and the monarchy? Self-portrait. The relationship between art and the individual? So this is a self-portrait of Velasquez. Of Velasquez right? And so if I'm, if I'm painting a copy of someone else's self-portrait, it has, to become a it has to also become a self-portrait. Right? He said, I would make it mine. So how is this then becoming a self-portrait of Picasso? Not a self-portrait in the sense of, I'm looking at myself in the mirror, but a self-portrait in the sense of, I am putting myself onto this canvas, perhaps. Picasso was greater than Velasquez. Look at that altitude. And maybe it's not Velasquez whose importance I want to emphasize, but my own. Right. Unless he's painting himself as the gumball machine. <laughs> or, or are all of them? Right. And what does he become everything? So what are the changes? Right. We talked earlier about value, the relative likeness or darkness. So he's almost completely reversed the value system. Right. Instead of a brooding interior space. Picasso has taken the paintings that line this wall in the royal um, palace in Madrid and turned them into windows. So he's opened up the royal chamber. He's filled it with light. He's also opened it up in the sense that the ceiling looks like an extension of the back wall. And the, whatever lamp or whatever is right. hanging down is now hanging on the wall. So that it's almost as if the, the roof's been blown off. You can see more dimensions than just three. Okay. More than so we'll get back to that in a minute. But okay, so what and what I was saying when in the second painting or in Picasso's painting, the first thing that I noticed is that person in the doorway, and that is the center of the painting to me when I see it. Mm -hmm. That is the center of the painting. Versus and then versus here, like you know, you see the Infanta, and then, like, I don't even really notice the person in the back. Uh, you kind of notice it, but the focus is in the front, mm -hmm. versus with Picasso, for me, my eye goes to, to the back of the painting, in the back of the space, mm -hmm. versus, you know, the front here. So, and so what, what Picasso has done is he's saying, I see Velasquez the way Daphne sees me. And so I'm going to paint that. So he's, Picasso is effectively saying, right, he's creating his version of this. So he's saying, when I see this, I'm drawn to that guy. 
And so that's what I'm going to emphasize here. It becomes a thing about this visual quotation and then how do I change it to reflect my own experience in front of this painting? And my own idea of who I am as a painter, he's in his uh, you know, late life at this point. He's 70, 73, something like that. Late in, late in life, he's coming up, and this is actually the result of a period where he spent, I think it was about four months and 60 paintings working on this, 60 different studies of Velasquez before he finished this one, including a few paintings of the pigeons that kept flying in through the window of his studio. So this is not just like a one-off, I'm going to do this and I'm done, right? He has spent time, and so it goes back to what Jan was saying of there is this tradition of artist training by studying the old masters. Picasso did it as a child. He did it all throughout his career with these various quotations of other sources. And now he's returning to it in this sense of, I still have something to learn from this. You know, I'm thinking, you know, teaching this to freshmen, mm -hmm. and you talk about visual quotation, and you know, they probably haven't seen a heck of a lot of this, but I bet they've seen somebody cover somebody else's music, right? And, and you try to say, you know, there's always that question of how much is it going to be like the original, and how much of your own style right. is, going to, is going to be present. You're jumping the gun. Okay, I'm sorry. No, you're, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And there's another Picasso quote that I didn't include, right? But it's, you know, good artists borrow, great artists steal. <laughs> Which is Picasso's very egotistical way of saying I'm a great artist because I stole all your stuff. Right? But it's this stating of the fact that despite our desire for innovation and originality, we always want something also in our in our great artworks of art that reference something that came before. Because we need past knowledge to help us understand new situations. So right, we can think about how this could enrich our understanding of what art could be. We could, and I'm going to run through this because I want to have time to do more of that in that conversation about with the students. Um, we could perhaps use this to help explain some new phenomena. So what were some new phenomena in the 20th century that Picasso's art maybe helps us understand? Well, when he developed Cubism in the first decade of the 20th century with George Brock, one of the things that had just happened was Einstein's theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that Picasso is trying to do is to make an artwork and a style of art that can communicate the fact that we can know things from different directions than our primary perspective, right? Than the, the one that we look from. And so also that like, okay, I put this chair on the table, you see a chair, but you also remember every chair you've ever sat in and you know the concept of chair, if we want to think about it, in that platonic sense, right? There's chairness, and then this is just a crude example of what chairness could be, right? And Picasso, if he painted this chair, would include chairness and the chair he sat in yesterday and his favorite chair at home, all in the painting of this chair. Because that's our actual experience of it. He's trying to create a painting that represents the truth of the experience, not the truth of visual perception, so to speak. And so we could take that same idea, even though at this point he's moved on and gone through, you know, ten other movements before he gets to this point in his career, we could use that as a framework to think about ways of understanding a new phenomenon. And what were the new phenomena of Picasso's life that he's trying to represent here? Two, 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 uh, two intellectual movements in addition cross my mind. One is the development of phenomenology and philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second is Gestalt psychology. Uh, things like the famous duck rabbit. Mm -hmm. uh, so in one respect, is it a duck or is it a rabbit? Well, I mean my own experience and take my experience by that. Mm -hmm. So I want to do that a little bit with 
this one, actually. So let's think a little bit more about what were some things that you know about the 17th century. And this is where I know that our students are going to fall flat on their faces because they don't even know what year the 17th century began in. <laughs> Hint, this is the middle of the 17th century. <laughs> Descartes. 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 Hobbes. 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 Bacon. Bacon. Yep. So the we're just rationalism. Right. We're dealing with the beginning of the Enlightenment and the debate between rationalism and empiricism. Or, as it was sometimes called in, experimentalism. This idea of trying things out. We also have the, this artist who was trained in a very traditional manner. He was an apprentice, and then he joined the patronage of a great house, and then he was sent abroad to study masters from another country, and he brought some of their secrets back with him, but he never settled into any of the schools within the bar Baroque painting tradition of his time. He was an individual, and one of the ways in which he is an individual is the fact that if we zoom in on this painting, and this is the one slide that didn't get saved in this version of the PowerPoint, I'm sorry, um, what we'll actually see is that none of these brush strokes look like things. I mean, if we zoom in right here on this piece of dress right here, you will not see a piece of dress. You will see a bunch of blobs. And if we zoom in on this puff in his sleeve, you will not see a sleeve puffing out through a slit. You will see a brush stroke. And we have also- Impressionism. It, so it's, it's impressions of this idea that it is not that I'm trying to represent each thing individually, but I am creating an overall sense of this experience, which, gets back to the Gestalt, although we're, at this point, 300 years prior, right? And we're dealing with this idea of where do we, how do we know things, right? That's the philosophical debate of the day, and we're at the royal court in Spain, which is heavily influenced by the Jesuits, so they're highly on the rationalist side, right? Not letting any of that empiricism, that perceptionalism in. But here we have this painting, painting ostensibly a royal portrait, on a mammoth scale, 10 feet tall, right? That's this whole wall. Without any of the details actually being details. And there are no details. The one detail there is, Velasquez never painted. The red cross on his doublet was added after his death because he wasn't ordered, awarded the Order of the Cross of St. James until three years after the painting was completed. And the myth is that the king himself altered the painting. We don't have any way of knowing that for sure. That's the story. So. <laughs> yes. So should they probably repeat? So we're gonna to have to translate this for the freshman. It says this is not a pipe. This is a painting by Rene Magritte. It's called The Treasury of Images. And what is it in fact if it is not a pipe? An image of a pipe. It's a painting of a pipe. It's in fact a projection of a photograph of a painting of a pipe at this point. <laughs> but, well, a, a projection of a digitization of a photograph <laughs> or a painting of a pipe. Right, so we're talking about the fact that our, the, the word is not the thing. Right. And we're seeing that in the painting of Velasquez. There's also an element in which the sentence isn't a pipe either. None of it is a pipe. Yeah. But to, to, to assume that the sense was referring to the picture. Oh, that the, 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 the reference of this is, yeah, the, yeah, is yeah. the image? Yeah. yeah. It could be self-referential. So, 
Real quick, I'm gonna run, run through this. This is the tradition, one of the traditions in which Velazquez is participating, the, the tradition of royal portraiture. Um, and so one of the earliest royal portraits that we have record of is the palette of Narmer. Um, it is actually a palette, like for mixing makeup, that's what this little recess on the back of it is. Um, but I blew this up so you can see a little bit more clearly. Here is Narmer, this um, pre-dynastic Egyptian king, and what's he doing? Uh, about to brain someone. Um, which is a great thing for a king to be doing, right? Showing your royal power. Is it the oh, and, and this is Pericles. Um, and the thing that we can talk about here is that both of these are portraits that are not portraits, in that they are representations of a king that look nothing like the king. Right? They are portraits that use canonized systems of rep representing human form. And Pericles wasn't a king anyway. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> sort of. Right. Whereas this portrait of Augustus, known as the Augustus of Prima Porta, does look like Augustus. And we know that because there are lots of portraits of Augustus, and they look exactly like him, and he shipped them all over the empire. So if he happened to show up on your doorstep, you would know it was him. And then they were copied for hundreds of years after that, because the Romans valued the individuality of the person rather than the reference to the ideal form that the king might take. And then even before Augustus sort of, you know, did his thing. We jump forward into the Middle Ages, and most portraits of kings look something like this, where they're performing religious rituals, which we can also find back in um, Egypt, Mesopotamia, um, and Greece, but not as much, no. Um, and so here, Justinian is presented uh, bringing an offering to the altar. Uh, the bishop is you know, almost even stepping on Justinian's toes because he was the bishop who commissioned the mosaic. <laughs> Justinian was never actually there. The bishop was. The mosaicist understood this. Um, so Justinian gets you know, one step forward. Um, and perhaps the most famous royal portrait of all time because Henry VIII actually had it copied just like Augustus did over and over and over again. So Holbein's original is lost. This was one done by one of his students uh, the year after the original was made. And if you do a Google image search for royal portrait of King Henry VIII, you will see all the many, many, many versions and copies of this. So this is, and this is about 100 years prior to Velazquez's painting. So this is one of the traditions into which he's placing himself. This tradition of preferring value onto a subject by the way that they're depicted. But we don't know who that value is being placed on in this painting. Because it is, in fact, not just a painting of her, and it's not just a painting of Velasquez, it is also a painting of the king and queen who are seen in the mirror in the back who are presumably the subject of the painting that Velasquez is painting. Right, because he is looking out at whoever is the subject of the painting he's working on who becomes us when we look at the painting. When we look at the painting, Velasquez is looking at us, which makes us the subject of his painting, which makes us the king and the queen. And so it is a painting about perspective. Not just linear perspective, but about knowing your place in the world and what it means to see and how we figure these things out. Brian, does Picasso have in the mirror? It, it's, it's essentially the same thing. I mean, it's, it's just a, but they're blurred out. You can't really see it. <laughs> what is this? What do you mean? That's a man. That's a man. Yeah, it's a silhouette of a man. He was one of the royal courtiers. He was a, a chamberlain, uh -huh. chamberlain, I think. Uh, we can find out his name if we go and look up. Because that's the first thing that I noticed in the past. That's right. So he's calling out this person who was just a servant. Too many things. Right. Whereas Velasquez is bringing us into the foreground rather than in that back. Right. Right. And, and, and what, what most art historians who do deep analysis on this will say is that the, the visual function of this person being here is the high contrast against the white wall to get you back there so that you see the king and the queen. So you see the king and the queen. So you go back and you see them and then you come back forward. Okay. 
And in that way, he's fulfilling his function as being a courier. He's guiding us to the king of the queen. He's even pointing at him. I know that Spain doesn't have the same kind of playing cards we have, but he, he looks a lot like a jack. <laughs> Which one does? With, yeah, Velaz Velazquez in Picasso's painting. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, he does. He does, yeah. Which sometimes often has the two perspectives. <laughs> There could also be an entire set, just like I ran through like the brief history of royal portraiture from 5,000 years ago, years ago to now. Um, there could be one of those for systems of perspective, um, showing what Velasquez was doing based on what he learned in Italy about linear perspective and atmospheric perspective, which some of you referenced earlier, um, you know, creating pictorial depth. What Picasso also does, but does in a less dogmatic way, right? he's still drawing us backward in space with these diagonal lines that lead us to a, a vanishing point. They're just not the rigid architectural lines of the room that Velasquez uses. So, I have three more minutes, but right, the point of us doing this now is for you to feel like you could maybe talk about this in the fall. And you're also going to have something else that you give them to read that you could tie in with it. Um, and there's certainly more resources that I could give you. You're welcome to have this PowerPoint. Um, but what do, you, what do you need to feel comfortable with this? What else could I do? What questions could I answer? Um, what other examples would you want? What did I mention but not give a, a picture for? Wait, did he do any more like this where he actually? He being this? Picasso? Yeah. Um, so a lot of his work is highly referential, um, but none of them were this explicitly um, compositionally copied. Um, if you look at his, his earliest um, work, there are a lot of, especially in the blue period, you'll see compositions where he stole a composition, but the figures are changed or something like that. Um, but none that are this explicitly like my version of this painting. So um, I guess like from the discussion, what we're hoping to do is kind of use this as an illustration of um, integrating knowledge across disciplines. So um, without like me trying to get like so immersed in um, in the very rich history of these pictures that I would I'm afraid I could lose like the students on mm -hmm. why we're talking about this like these paintings. How would you help us to lift up the idea of um, integrating knowledge across or I should say rather building on a tradition? You know, build that, you know, bringing across the tradition, looking back on the past. Like, are there like some some particular important things that we could put up there about like looking back on a tradition to solve the problem? Um. So we could. I mean, I guess the perspective example would be a good one of what Velasquez is trying to do to get us, like he's using perspective in this sense to get us into the background. He could have done all of this without it, right? The wall could be immediately behind the foreground. We could have nothing past this, this moment right here, right? But instead, we have this other space. He's using linear perspective to draw us in there. So he's using this tool that he learned when he was in Italy to solve a pictorial problem he has of getting the viewer to come back here into this other space before bringing them back into the foreground. And then also, I mean, like, I don't know, like, what would be an effective way to get them talking about the, the reliance of, contempor of very contemporary things on tradition and uh, being part of a tradition? I guess that's kind of more my question. So, so that's where, and, and I didn't explicitly bring it back up, but, but with Eddie's point about um, sampling and the you know, musical quotation 
system in modern pop music, right? We could talk about how even small pieces of something like this comes forward. And so if we look at like Jean-Michel Basquiat, who was a painter in the 80s, who referenced some, some of the things that Picasso was doing in paintings like this, um, and continuing to bring them forward, not as explicitly copying, but pulling small pieces forward in the way that a musician might pull a Billie Holiday beat into a 2018 um, song and then rap over it with their own lyrics or something. There are some men comment once upon a time. He said, man is the most imitated of the enemies. Uh, I wonder whether some of the themes that you're touching on would be, how is it and in how many dimensions do we imitate? You mentioned likenesses of likenesses, uh, and you show this in various ways with reference to the madness of the, not the territory, the unity. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder whether uh, exploring, say, uh, without getting into semiotics or uh, mm -hmm. various other disciplines, or, or maybe even doing just that. So, what should we be doing with these paintings? Uh, how do we? Uh, and as far as the issue of the education or tradition is concerned, what about comparing the training of Velasquez with comparing the training of Picasso? They're actually trained almost identically. Um, the only difference being that by the time Picasso was um, going through his training, the apprenticeship, the apprenticeship system had turned into the Royal Academies. Um, and so Picasso was trained in the academic system, uh, which grew out of the Baroque and Renaissance medieval apprenticeship system. What do you make of the lack of detail in the bottom right corner? What does that say to you? I, 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 I don't personally know, and I haven't spent enough time researching the paintings to know what other scholars know. My guess is that it's there to give us somewhere to rest. Right, so we, we can come over here, let our eyes rest, and then come back into the rest of the composition. Um, and, and, that, and that fits with a lot of the formalism of the 20s and 30s that Picasso never really officially fell in with, but was certainly influenced by in that between the wars period it was going on a lot of other a lot, a lot of other artists who were strictly worried with formalism, not representation at all. I think one of the things I really like about this to illustrate that point is if you just gave me this painting here, I would not really engage it very deeply. But and if you just gave me this too, I wouldn't either. But like it looks a bit old and stuffy at this point. Right. Yeah. But I'm not hanging that on my wall either. <laughs> but, but having the two you don't, together, you, you don't think dwarves should be forced into royal servitude? <laughs> so much, oh, oh, so much to say. But but having them together and having a tradition there, you know, gives a lot of the richness to the discussion. Um, and maybe in that way, we can kind of prod our students to, you know. And I like how you're describing his take on originality, right? Like, you know. A solipsistic, one of a kind thing. I mean, a lot of us strive, a lot of our students strive to, for that kind of an ideal, but it's boring, right? And and it's hard to relate to. But belonging to just the the, the tradition between the connection between these two paintings allows us to engage them in a much deeper way and makes it more interesting. And that might be a way of suggesting to them the value of. Um, engaging in the past to, to come up with a new solution. Um, it, it, when you contribute to a bigger project, it's just more interesting. Well, and it, gets, it also gets back to the humility yeah. aspect of, do you really think you're going to be the person who come up, comes up with something you know, whole cloth? No, you're going to take from the things that have come before you, um, because otherwise you have to start with a ball of clay. Yeah, but I mean, I think a lot, I think, I think 18 year olds are, are like, you know, predisposed to think, yeah, it will come up with it for nothing, right? <laughs> but, even Facebook was named after something, right? Like a um, I, I think the less I know about this, the better, in this sense. Um, I won't be tempted to come off as, you know, an expert mm -hmm. and, and to, say, to say, okay, I am just a little bit ahead of you in this being a new experience. Mm -hmm. And so I can maybe out loud try to practice that habit of mind of what, what, what is my past knowledge to confront this new experience. And it would be so easy for me to say, 
listen, I don't know anything about this, but I know something about something, and I can try to do that. So when you're confronted with something, never say, I don't know anything about this. There's got to be some sort of hook right. that you can that you can. Which gets back to this framework yes. of, well, which one would I want to claim, or which one would I want to own, or there's at least something that we can use to get in with. The other thing that, that I think, and I do this often, my students often assume that I'm only showing them artwork that I think is the best artwork in the world, or that I love, and I, I don't like this painting, right? Like, I, and I'm, I'm happy to say that to them at the beginning, right. and you should too. If this isn't your cup of tea, tell them that, but you have to then say, but, right, this isn't my cup of tea, but I can still learn from this. Mm -hmm. As doing something new in the tradition of this is really interesting. Right, yeah. I mean, like, what would, how do I express the modern situation in the context of the tradition? Well, he does that really, in a really interesting way. And if it were a one-off. So, so I have more questions about the basis of the Picasso one. It, it strikes me some of those images look like the images in other artists uh, of paintings, like, like especially the, the girl who's a uh, far left girl, the far left attendant. Yeah, I mean that looks like a little bit like uh, uh, maybe um, some of the paintings of uh, like Aztec art or things like that. And, but then you look at the kind of the guy who looks like he's got a bow on his hand. <laughs> I think the bodyguard guy. Mm -hmm. Seems like Spires I've seen that guy before too in art as well. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, and, and eventually, right, the, the forms become so ubiquitous mm -hmm. that they all seem familiar. Um, I, I don't know personally whether or not Picasso is quoting anyone other than Velasquez oh, in this point. That's what I was asking. I, I don't know. I, I, w I wouldn't deny it. Right. Um, and, and I don't know specifically about Picasso and Mesoamerican art, but he was. Um, very um, explicitly a copier of African art. Right. So, do you want us to assign the two the two videos that you? Like? So, I, I, that's actually a question. So, I I think the two videos together give give people at least a footing. The third one, I don't know if it would really be helpful for our students. It's a little much, and she goes so quickly. Um, and it's just sort of like, Bleh. but it deals with this idea of copying, right? And being and copying being part of the tradition. So, what do you what do you guys think about the videos? Were they helpful? Did you watch them? Did you watch the third one? The third one was on copying. It was about nine minutes long. Just the two. Yeah. I, I don't have anything to say about the third video, but I do want to know whether anybody else is going to be talking about copying in the sense of plagiarism and how that's different from the kind of copying that you do as you're building your skills. Right. Where did we have that? We had that in one of them. The Iron Code is in one of them. Yeah, I, for, I don't think it was this one specifically, though. Well, Picasso cites his work, right? He cites his work. It out. That's he at least did this so many so scales. I don't know. Yeah, in this case, he cites it. Yeah. He's not like, what, Velasquez did a painting like this? <laughs> <laughs> This is just a, a note for you. Um, it is fair use to use images of artwork when you are talking about them as artwork. It is not fair use to use images of artwork as illustrations of, of something else. <laughs>